session from the ones that we typically um, conduct in the sense that this is really talking about um, some of the trades and you know the way we look at the markets on a day-to-day um, -day basis and I think this was really interesting because in the month of September we had a tremendous amount of um, big announcements volatility and opportunities in the Forex market now the month of October has been off to a slower start and um, that's you know maybe the case for the most of the month but I think that between the European Central Bank meeting some of the really big events that we're anticipating in December I think that volatility is probably going to return so that's something that's um, you know really important to prepare for because when we do have that return of volatility you'll be able to um, capitalize on that opportunity and also you know, some of you are interested in swing trading. We've where you know, I know I personally provide a tremendous amount of um, tips on as well as um, trading strategies. But what we really excel at, um, although I would have to say we do all of it pretty well, what we really um, do on a daily basis is we day trade, and um, and that's something that you know we wanted to express in terms of you know taking a look at how we view the markets on a regular basis so this presentation is called how I traded the top five biggest events of September and hopefully you can get some insight into how I analyze um, the markets how we um, are able to make money uh, consistently trading some of um, the most high-profile events like non farm payrolls even though many people avoid them they can actually be filled with opportunity before I begin, um, I'd like to share with you this disclaimer um, that basically says, uh, you know, that you know these are my opinions, not those of Pepperstone. So you know, make sure you're aware about that, and it doesn't take into account your personal objectives or financial situation. And of course, you know, trading forex carries a high level of risk and may not be suitable for all investors. So make sure you're fully um, aware of that as well. So, taking a look at this um, at this market, at this um, opportunity that we have, we're going to start by looking at you know how I trade every day. Now, I'll be honest, you know the reason why we're late is because we got the time you know off a little bit. We thought that this was starting at six thirty and five thirty. I actually start my day at six thirty New York time, which is an hour from now. And um, I want to walk you through the process of how I start my day because because um, it was right around the time that I was looking at the markets. But I think it's fine. I think that we can still do that um, today at this time because you know five thirty, six thirty New York time. You know, um, you know, whatever time it is currently in your time zone is still a really great opportunity to start looking at fresh North American. Um, session or your you know evening session trades many of you may only have the opportunity to trade um, in the evening and um, and that's perfectly fine because if you only have the opportunity to trade um, in the evening in fact that is the best time to trade because that's when we have the most opportunities um, in in the markets because that's when you know the biggest movements always happen during the US um, European overlap so how do I start my day and how do I look for trading opportunities well there's a couple of things um, that I do you know first and foremost I assess the overnight news and price action because in our experience between you know, shortly after um, the European market open, you kind of start establishing the flows and themes and momentum of the day. Between um, the North American open and the European close, you oftentimes will get um, a lot of that continuation. So this kind of leverages on the idea that what happens or you know some of the sentiment that is um, generated in the European session 
will oftentimes carry over to the North American session and many times all the way over to the um, to, to the European the, be, the beginning of the European trading session the following day so pretty much from so pretty much from um, Some people say they can't hear me. Um, pretty much, I hope everyone can hear me now. But um, pretty much from, can everyone hear me? Do I need to start over again? Okay, so pretty much from you know the. North American session, the, sometimes the, the flow carries over all the way to the the um, beginning of the uh, European sorry, session. Guys. Sorry guys, we had a little issue here. Uh, we probably would need to start again the webinar. The first maybe five minutes uh, haven't been recorded. Would it be alright, Kitty? Sorry. Yeah, no problem. We can go ahead and get started again. Perfect. Okay, let me know when we're ready to go. Yeah, we're ready. Thank you. Okay. Hello, everyone. This is Kathy Lean. I'm excited to share with you um, how you know I traded the top five biggest events of September. Now, this may seem like it's um, you know talking about you know something that happened in the past, but September was a huge month for us. We made more than a thousand pips, um, mostly live trading and taking advantage of some of the biggest events. And while October seems to be off to a slower start, um, and perhaps October, you know, most of October will be relatively subdued, I think that um, with the European Central Bank meeting, with the December FOMC meeting, um, some of the big moves and volatility um, will probably return and is likely to return. So we will, don't necessarily expect you know, this kind of low vol environment to continue for very long. And I think that you know, that's probably the most important um, takeaway, which is that you know, if whatever you learn from today's session, you can not only use it to trade you know, some of the biggest events like non-farm payrolls, but also um, you know, maybe capitalize on the volatility in the Forex market when it increases. And of course, you know, past performance is not indicative of future results. You know, these are just examples of how we um, how we um, take advantage of some of the opportunities provided by um, news events. Now, this disclaimer just says these are my opinions, not Pepperstones, um, and you know, please, and they don't take into account your individual situation. Um, this disclaimer says, you know, trading Forex um, carries a high level of risk and may not be suitable for all investors. Um, so please um, read through the disclaimer if you're watching this on demand before you um, move ahead. So I want to start by talking about how I trade every day and how I look at the markets every single day. Now, um, I'll admit that, you know, typically I start my trading day at 6.30 um, New York time. And... And, um, you know, which is basically 9.30, um, I guess, AEST or your AEDT, which is um, your time. But I think that, you know, this kind of um, technique, you know, could still work even starting now because the whole um, premise of my day trades is that whatever momentum that's starting to build up in Europe is oftentimes carried over into um, the North American session, and sometimes, you know, even all the way over to um, the Asian close um, and the European open the following day. You know, we've got um, a bunch of accounts that are that are kind of mirroring our trades using diff that we're testing mirroring our trades using different um, time frames for closing the trades, and they basically um, show us that, you know, oftentimes the flow and the momentum and the themes of the day that have begun in the um, prior European trading session um, will oftentimes carry all the way through to the following day. So that doesn't always happen. Sometimes we do have reversals, and reversals are a little bit more common in low vol environments, but um, generally speaking, you know, we've been trading, our, we've been using this technique for our day trades for 
um, a while now, and it's been very effective. And unlike Boris, who's more of a systematic trader, um, I'm much more of a discretionary trader, and that is true on both a fundamental as well as um, technical basis, and also true on a day trading as well as swing trading basis. Although I have to say, you know, my preferred style is always on um, swing trading. I shared a lot of that information to you, but on a day to day basis, I also do a lot of um, day trading. So the first part of my, um, the first thing I do whenever I start my day is assess the overnight um, news and price action. Take a look at, you know, what's some of the big stories that may have been impacting the markets overnight and use that um, to help me determine what I'm going to, um, what could potentially carry over to the following day. So now is a really good time to kind of practice, do that exercise together. Um, because, you know, now, yeah, it's a little earlier than I usually um, look at these trades, but, you know, so usually it's quieter during this time, so um, the opportunities are really no different. So I start by looking at, um, you know, the yields. That's the first thing I look at whenever I um, start my day. And you can also, you know, kind of, and this is my Bloomberg, my professional Bloomberg terminal. And you can also look at yields on tradingview.com, which is, a, is just a free charting package. And also bloomberg.com um, gives you a slightly delayed feed on where yields are. So I start my day by looking at where yields are. And generally speaking, by 6.30, you get more of a, or, or 9.30 AEDT, um, you get a better sense of, you know, where they want to be. But, you know, sometimes, you know, this is pretty accurate as well. So. What these yields show me is that, you know, U.S. yields are up slightly. Canadian yields don't open until um, 7 o'clock New York time, so this is not accurate. But you want to look at um, U.S. yields are up slightly. U.K. yields are up slightly, and German yields are down. And you've got your Australian and New Zealand yields that are up marginally. So basically, you know, German yields are down, U.K. yields are up. And let's take a look at... Um, overnight data to see, you know, where we were in terms of some of the um, key data sets. So last night we had New Zealand CPI come out. It was stronger than expected, which um, is encouraging because the RBNC, has, Reserve Bank of New Zealand, has been um, quite dovish. So it's encouraging that, you know, they, this data was um, stronger because it means that, you know, maybe they, they – um, could start thinking like some of their counterparts and not be so cautious on their outlook um, for the economy. We also have um, UK CPI numbers. And for the most part, UK CPI numbers were right in line with expectations. Um, on a month-to-month -month basis, this is weaker than um, the this is weaker than the uh, previous month. Um, on an annualized basis, you know, it's pretty much the same. So you know, no major surprises there. The retail price index was a little bit softer, but I think the market looks at CPI more. These numbers, you know, aren't great, um, you know, in light of Brexit risks, but they aren't terrible either and should be enough, you know, especially with inflation running at 3% to support the Bank of England's case for tightening. We also had the zoo survey from Germany um, and the Eurozone. No surprise that sentiment dropped because, um, you know, all the problems in Spain and Catalonia was likely to take a toll on investor sentiment. And later today, we don't really have much in the way of market moving U.S. data, you know, only industrial production, not a huge market mover. So then we take our bird's eye view of the market. Um, take a look at our bird's eye view of the market. You know, first and foremost, the euro is weak. The euro um, is probably the weakest currency. Um, it is the weakest currency. And sterling um, is flat, although, you know, it looks a little weak and soft as well. So euro is the weakest currency. It looks like it wants to roll over some more. And, you know, we'll take a look at, you know, how far it can go in a second. But, you know, this is where I kind of start to establish my um, sentiment of the day. You know, starting off, you know, very clear, we're probably going to, be looking at negative euro trades. We're probably going to look at negative pound trades too, but um, it's you know more of a catch-up move 
than anything else. Dollar yen, um, neither here nor there. It's definitely got resistance at 112.30s, um, support at 111.70s. We don't have much in the way of U.S. data. We have a lot of U.S. exogenous risks in the form of um, North Korea as well as the selection of a Fed chair. Caddy has been um, firm, but this candle's um, not really an encouraging candle. So, you know, perhaps the, the rally in dollar CAD may fizzle. And both Aussie and Kiwi, you know, just on a cursory basis, look like they um, could kind of tip over. So that's just kind of gives me a bird's eye view of um, where the market is. Our second step is to look for continuation into the London close. So you have an option of either just holding your positions till the um, London close, or you can carry it all the way to um, the Asia Open the following day. And you know we'll look at that in, in a moment. And the third step is that I always look for moving average um, clearance. I'm a big moving average trader. Um, I think they're very useful. I've used them for you know quite some time, and um, and you know I definitely I definitely always make sure that I have moving average clearance. So what do I mean by moving average clearance? So let's say you know I think Euro looks like a great short, but you know how much room do we have to sell? You know on a daily basis we can see that you know I've got my um, blue line which is the 50 moving average, the yellow line or the gold line which is 20 minute moving average. The red line, which is the 100, and the green line, which is the 200. So the 20, 50, 100, 200, my favorite moving average to look at. So the first thing I always look at is I always look at the four-hour chart. So on a four-hour basis, you can see we're below all the moving averages, so we do have moving average clearance, meaning there's no um, moving averages sitting you know, right below current levels for me to short. So it's not as if I'm shorting into this zone right over here. Um, now, of course, 1750 itself could be a little bit of support, but at least from a four hour basis, it looks like we have clearance. From an hourly basis, it also looks like um, we have clearance, and it also looks like we can go all the way down. Now, I, I, in addition to that, um, the four hour, six hour, uh, one hour, those you know, kind of just kind of confirm to me that you know they're that we've got clearance to to basically sell, and that we could potentially move lower. So your dollar looks like a pretty good candidate to sell today. Now, pound dollar and daily charts, it's not really clear what it's doing. It's neither here nor there. It's flat. But um, we do have moving average clearance all the way to 130, 150. Four-hour charts also show we have moving average clearance. In fact, four-hour charts is even better because it shows that we have move, moving average um, overhang where it's saying that, you know, it's going to have a tough time rising back above 132. Um, 90. And same thing with the 60 minute chart, a lot of moving average um, overhang. So this actually um, looks like a great candidate um, to potentially sell for a move down to 131.50. Dollar yen, um, we do not have any type of moving average clearance here because we've got resistance at 30, support at 112. Um, so this is not, there's no trading opportunity here for me. So I would even be inclined to take a pound dollar short, um, you know, right here, 132.53. And we can even, you know, consider that as a, um, as a trade, 132.53. And I'll show you the parameters um, later on. Dollar CAD. Yeah, you know, we've also got moving average clearance to the upside. So I would definitely, so in the daily chart, while it shows, originally it was telling me that maybe there was some um, resist, uh, you know, that it was kind of, the move was fading. On the four hour and one hour chart, it looks like it's just all clear. We could definitely see some additional movements in um, dollar CAD. Aussie dollar, also moving average resistance. You know, moving average, um, although it doesn't have moving, average clearance because it's got support at 78.16. So still, the best candidate right now looks like pound. And um, you know, no moving average clearance on Kiwi dollar on the daily chart or on the four hour chart. And dollar Swiss should be, you know, looking pretty bid. And you know, that that looks pretty good to the upside. So 
that's the majors. I still I also do this exercise on the um, crosses as well. But right now, you know, pound dollar looks like and dollar Swiss looks like our best opportunities. I also um, like euro pound on a fundamental basis, but on a technical basis, we're right at the 20 SMA. But the four-hour charts show us that we have clearance. So you know, I might be inclined to sell um, euro pound as well, but we'll just stick with pound for now. The yen crosses also look pretty weak. Um, I like euro yen to the downside. And usually I select anywhere between um, three to four trades. I really like CAD yen. I mean, dollar CAD looked like really it was really um, going upwards. And CAD yen really looks like it's rolling over. So we can try an 89.38 sell on CAD yen to, uh, as well. So just walking you through the exercise that I tend to do to, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Although by the time I go through all my charts, sometimes I may make adjustments. Kiwi Yen looks really good on a daily basis. A lot of when you have daily or moving average overhang, that's an even stronger trade. But four hours are above the moving averages, so that's not good opportunity for us. Pound Yen looks good, but we're already in pound dollar, and that's a lower vol trade. Um, not seeing much opportunities in these other pairs. Let's see. All right, so I think those are the best opportunities that we see um, right now, pound dollar and CAD yen. So, you know, I would select my trades based upon, um, you know, looking, looking for a moving average clearance, and then I would set my parameters for stop and target. So we said that, you know, we can kind of go come back and review these, um, these trades later after our, when our webinar ends, but we um, sold pound dollar 132.53. And um, typically when we are trading this through London, we use a 30 stop 20 target. And we're carrying through Asia, we use um, a 30 stop 30 target. So um, through London is slightly, um, you know, less desirable risk reward, but still, um, but still, you know, we usually have about I would say 70% accuracy on this, so it still nets us positive on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so, you know, we'll look at one uh, pound dollar 132.53. Our stop is going to be at 83. Target's going to be at 33. CAD yen, um, our stop is going to be at 68, and target is going to be at 18. So, for those of you that are following me, um, that's what I will be looking at. Um, you know, in t today in terms of trading opportunities. So, while I, um, that's how I look at the markets um, every single day, and that's how I, um, that's the thought process that I go through for my day trades. The biggest opportunities of the day and the month, um, of the month and on a daily basis, um, basically involves trading news. Now, most traders avoid trading news for, um, for the following reasons. First, the one of the greatest um, challenges of trading news is that um, spreads will widen. Currencies, you know, that's probably the single single-handedly the greatest risk. You know, with some brokers, they widen to 20, 30 pips, depending upon what pair you're trading, which is you know very, very significant. But spreads will widen, and um, you know, you might be stopped out if you're using a tight stop just by the spread alone. Um, secondly, you'll have huge spikes um, and and huge reversals, and sometimes those spikes may not be in your favor. And a lot of people are afraid that um, even if they had a 20 pip stop, if it's a huge spike, they could actually be filled at you know minus 40, minus 50, um, because you know it was such a big news event. It's a runaway move, and. The third challenge is that um, it's difficult to trade news and to predict and to understand it because a lot of times there could be reversal risks. And when there's reversal um, risk, you know, it suddenly will spike higher and then it may completely reverse. And so you don't, you know, you don't know what should be the real reaction of the markets. But we excel 
at Trading News. We traded um, 10 major events in the month of September, and I think there was only one that um, we didn't uh, make money from. And this included FOMC, non-farm payrolls, ECB. Of course, past performance is not indicative of future results, but I'll show you how we do it. The first step, though, to trading news is knowing the difference between high volatility and low volatility events. Because low volatility events um, are not you know, events that are really treatable. And low volatility events sometimes um, may surprise you because sometimes it can be rate decisions. And sometimes um, they, they are not the ones that you think are low volatility. And some of the, I mean, obviously the high volatility events are generally the obvious ones, but sometimes, you know, it um, can also be data like retail sales. Not only is there a difference between high volatility and low volatility events, but there's also a difference between high volatility and low volatility sessions. We traded um, RBNZ um, last month, and RBNZ was kind of a slow glacial move after the rate decision because it was during the Asian trading session, because there wasn't as much participation, because um, there wasn't as much people watching the event. And so that's why... Um, it didn't generate the same type of volatility that you may anticipate for a U.S. non-farm payrolls or um, U.S. retail sales report. So the type of news events that produce the greater volatility may not be what you think. When it comes to news trading, there's also it's also important to know the difference between fade versus trade. We will fade and we will trade. Um, we generally uh, follow the flow at the initial onset of the move, and then we'll look for opportunities to fade it um, later on. So, you know, there's different uh, phases of the day trading cycle that we, um, that we kind of uh, follow whenever we are um, day trading. So, I want to show you how we did this in real life um, examples and how we traded some of these top five biggest events. And, you know, while I could, you know, kind of walk you through theoretically, you know, how I would have done it, I think there's no better example than to see us do this and how we actually reacted in a live environment. These, and so what I'm saying is that we actually did this in live environments, and um, I'll show you how, you know, we looked at the markets. And I'm not going to, you know, you can see this live trading non from payrolls is hour and 15 minutes. I'm obviously not going to walk you through the whole thing. So I'm going to give you the highlights. Whenever we trade a big news event, we always start with looking at um, basically, sorry, we basically start with looking at some of the um, setup beforehand. So this was the last non-farm payrolls report. I'm just trying to fast forward to um, this part, which kind of walks you through, you know, why is non-farm payrolls report and, and some of the pregame that we put in. Just give me a second. Um, start reducing or start uh, reducing asset purchases, and they are expected. So I want to start right over. Um, if we go to the next slide, these numbers are pretty much the same as the previous month. Current eighty thousand um, headline number, unemployment rate four point three percent, average hourly earnings zero point two percent. So, in terms of how non-farm payrolls could fare. Generally speaking, the U.S. economy you know, is chugging along. So, you know, these are numbers aren't necessarily you know out of question. But I think it's important to realize that these forecasts represent um, a deterioration from the previous month, where um, previously we had more than 200,000 job growth. In so that's the highlight of that. But I want to show you this. Okay, this is what I really want to show you. Every single month, when we um, look at event risk and for non-farm payrolls in particular, we always, um, you know, we always try to first figure out whether we can trade this event risk proactively or whether we should only trade it reactively. Proactively basically involves putting on the trade, um, putting on the trade before the data release and, you know, hoping it goes our way. And reactively basically involves putting on the trade after the data release. So in this specific case, um, you know, we always with non-farm payrolls kind of stack up the um, 
arguments in favor of a stronger versus non -farm, a weaker non-farm payrolls. Um, so you can see that here um, the arguments are far exceeding the stronger payrolls over weaker payrolls. But we also we still had a negative view on the dollar. And if you were attending session or for you, I actually played through the video. Um, I explained that this month in particular, the um, leading indicators for non-farm payrolls are not as reliable because generally speaking, we have eight of them. We have um, all the ones that you see here, in addition to non-manufacturing ISM, which is the most important leading indicator for NFPs, because non-manufacturing ISM measures the conditions in the um, measures the conditions in the service sector, which is basically what non-farm payrolls measures. And we're also missing the um, ISM manufacturing index. And um, and so, therefore, we're missing a lot of key components that you know make up this this um, non-farm payrolls uh, story. And we talked about how um, you know this was going to be distorted by um, the hurricanes, and it was going to to be you know uh, potentially some type of hurricane effect. So let's move on to the actual. Um, data release. Well, actually, I have a little bit of a game plan that I put together, too, for, okay, here we go. Yes, and whenever it comes to non-farm payrolls, average hourly earnings are always more important than the headline so, number. Um, all of that makes um, non-farm payrolls best treated reactively rather than um, uh, proactively, which is basically taking on a trade before the date. So how are we going to trade non-farm payrolls? Um, if you take a look at the chart that I put up, um, just move one more slide forward. This chart. So this is where we just kind of lay out the game plan. Um, if non-farm payrolls is above a certain number and wage growth is above a certain number, then we're going to buy dollar yen. If it's below a certain number, um, then we're going to sell dollar yen. But when it comes to U.S. data, uh, and this is important with news trading, which is that when it comes to U.S. data, you have the full gamut of um, instruments that you could potentially trade. Whereas um, with Canadian data, I mean, you can really only trade the loony, and po probably the purest reaction is dollar CAD. Or with um, New Zealand data, you probably just want to trade Kiwi dollar because the purest reaction is generally in Kiwi dollar. But with U.S. data, you really have the gamut, full gamut of trading um, opportunities. So let's fast forward to when the data actually comes out. Okay. Off of, um, a so you, in this, so we're 30 seconds, if you look over here, away from the non-farm um, payrolls report, you look at above the words all economic releases, a little time counter, you see dollar is trading at 110.04, euro dollar at 119.24. So I'm sure we talked also about what we were going to trade off of a weak number, which was euro dollar, um, because you know European I explained because of European fundamentals and you know some of the issues that they were doing. So I was going to sell. Um, we were trade euro dollar and dollar CAD off of a weak number, Kiwi dollar and dollar yen off of a strong number. And I'm just going to follow the trades out. I'll try to post them in the room. But I can't guarantee you that I'll be able to do so. So just to say, so we're ten nine seconds away from a lease. CAD is at one twenty four forty four. Euro is at one nineteen twenty two. So eight seconds to NFPs. So I expect speaking to pace to wait, um, but you know we'll see. Hello. So very weak number one fifty six. Um, and most importantly, average hourly earnings 0.1%. So our game plan was dollar CAD and euro dollar off of a weak number and um, dollar yen and Kiwi dollar off of a strong number. So this is a weak number. We're going to be buying euros as well as selling dollar CAD. Also, just that is possible number 445. Um, so it's a very weak number. And so what we're going to do is we're going to buy euro dollar right here at 109.54. I meant one nineteen fifty four, but that's what it was. I, I got short the twenty four hundred on the caddy. So I bought euros at one nineteen fifty four. Boris sold dollar cad for us at one twenty four. 
and this was at 8.30.13, immediate reaction to the non-farm payrolls report. And that's why it's so important to have a game plan because, you know, sometimes, you know, while Dalian also got crushed down there, you want to be able to react instantly by having a game plan beforehand. Now let's see what happens next. So even with a soft release, and you know, a terribly soft release in this case, um, sometimes you get a really big move quickly, sometimes it takes a little while. So we oftentimes, when it comes to news trading, with our first trade, you need to be nimble with your profits. You can't be too greedy. Yeah, so I'm sure 2400 caddy, looking at, looking to close it out, and I close it out. So Boris closed his CAD at 123, about 70, um, seven. By the time he got it, it was probably 75 for plus 25. So, done on that trade. so by the time he filled, it was probably 123.75. Um, uh, how, how bad was the number, Kay? I didn't see it. So basically, it's 156,000 uh, versus 180,000 forecast. The unemployment rate increased and average hourly earnings completely um, slowed. So, so this is a really this, um, terrible this number. Truly affordable number. So again, it's crashing through the uh, 109. It's kind of holding above this 108.50. Okay, let me um, I'll just quickly take the screen back. Okay, so basically, you know, euro dollar, um, it's at 119.67. It goes up to about seven uh, low 70s, and that's where um, I end up closing my trade. You know, we go on to some other stuff, but um, then that's where I end up closing my trade. So we've got 20. Um, pips on dollar cad, another maybe 20, um, I would say maybe 18, 20 pips on euro dollar on our first um, euro dollar as well as dollar cad trade. So in the first minute or so post release, we probably made about, you know, 30 or 40 pips. Um, I, you know, we use some other brokers platform afterwards that I don't want to show. So um, that's why I'm stopping it here. But the process is that, you know, the, you know, you can see this is 13 minutes into it. We go for another hour. So what happens for the next hour? We keep trading, and generally speaking, for that next hour, what I will do is I will continue to press the same direction. We'll continue to go into the same trade, um, in the same direction, and Boris will move off and start to look at um, key levels that are, you know, um, round number breaks in that same direction as well. So um, if we assess the data to be strong enough, we usually kind of ride it into the same direction. Let's look at um, another one, Bank of Canada rate decision. Um, rate decisions sometimes are very impactful, sometimes are um, not so impactful, and um, it really depends upon what they do. So let's see with the Bank of Canada. Hey everybody, welcome to a month of luck. So with rate decisions, what I like to do is, um, I'm going to fast forward to the table that I create. Okay, so every month, whenever we have a rate decision, um, you know, our analysis involves taking a look, you know, trying to put our shoes in the, ourselves into the shoes of a central banker. And so we basically look at how the economy changed from one meeting to the next. And if you are getting Pepperstone's emails um, every week before the rate decision, we will um, we will put together this table included in the um, in the in the weekly report and um, talk about you know what we think could happen. And so, taking a look at this table here, um, taking a look at this table here, you can see that. There's a lot of unevenness in the Canadian economy. Um, on a consumer basis, um, retail sales was kind of weaker. Employment was mixed, um, but we did see strength in the housing market, GDP, and you know basically everything was mixed. So given this kind of mixed outlook, it wasn't a given that they were going to change policy. So then we'll move over to our game plan, and unlike um, non-farm payrolls. Um, we talked about how with non-farm payrolls we can trade um, anything but with something like you know Bank of Canada rate decision the only real thing to trade is um, dollar cad and we said if because the purest reaction will be in dollar cad so we said that you know if 
the Bank of Canada hikes by 25 basis points, you're going to sell dollar cat. If they focus on the concerns about the currency, then you'll buy dollar cat. So I'm um, just going to, so, you know, here's also the table that I put together. Valid cat would go 125 if um, the BOC is concerned about strong cat, and 122 if they hike or signal that a uh, hike is coming. So let's move forward and look at when they actually, um, the rate decision. Okay. So here we're nine seconds away if you look at above um, all economic releases. We also have at the same time ISN non-manufacturing index. So um, we, we're looking at dollar CAD as well as dollar Swiss or dollar yen for non-manufacturing ISM. And dollar CAD itself was trading at 124.05. Well, we'll see. Five seconds away. So Canada raises interest rates to 1%. So immediately we remember our game plan um, chart that we put together, a very methodical approach, which is that we're selling dollar cat. They um, raise interest rates. But you know, take a look at what happens. Dollar cat you know, did drop all the way to 122. So either you have fast fingers and you wrote it down immediately, or 57.5, good number on the ISM should be so the first trade is that you sell um, dollar CAD and you sell it and you know easily capture 20 30 pips in the initial move um, and then we also traded dollar Swiss because ISM was um, stronger and you know I think you said that dollar Swiss for about 99 um, 52 uh, but obviously you know dollar Swiss doesn't move as much as dollar CAD so the real action was in dollar CAD so this is a huge, you see, now you'll see that dollar cat is starting to move back upwards. So you have the sell off and then the reversal. So we stand down on the um, reversal because if you take a look at um, the price action, you can see that it starts to move back up to 122.10 if you're looking at the CAD part. So we stand down on CAD and we focus on dollar Swiss. So we wrote the CAD down initially. Um, at, the, at the kind of knee jerk and just we were nimble. I mean you can't expect um, if you're too greedy and try to expect you know, 50, 60 pips, I think we caught 20 pips off of it, you may be swept up in the reversal. You want to get it in and out quickly and then see if the market continues to agree with you because you always press lower. So we went um, long dollar Swiss, I think it was um, 50s and um, we stay into the trade and you know probably get up out for just a 10 pip move because there's a lot of moving average overhang and we decided not to, to stay in the trade. I'm just going to show you um, one more and this one we can actually watch it throughout because I have my um, Bloomberg as well as e-signal although you know we can look at FOMC as well but BOE rate decision um, and same story uh, with BOE rate decision we look the pregame is always to look at the table. And in this case, um, you know, at first glance, you can see there's definitely a bit more improvement than deterioration in, um, there's more improvement than deterioration in the UK economy. The unemployment labor market was very strong. Inflation, which is very important for them, was um, up as well. Retail sales, on the other hand, was a little softer. Um, but you know, even at first glance, you can see a bit more improvement than deterioration for um, pound. So let's move over to our game plan chart. So for this particular month, no hikes or cuts were expected. So what we're focusing on is how they voted. And the whole idea is that if they voted 6-3 to keep rates steady, we would buy the pound dollar. If they voted 7-2, and they downplayed um, inflation, we would um, sell pound dollar. So the table, I'm mean, sorry, the chart um, just kind of outlines that. You know, we're, we were ending the day at 132, and um, you know, we would do 130, we we'll look for we'll move to 133.50 if they're hawkish, and then move down to 131 if they're dovish. 
So let's move forward to when they um, actually make their rate decision, which I think is, um, okay, so it's right over here. So let's just start a tad bit before. And at the time, pound dollar still trading at 132.09, pretty much where our chart was. Rising into the rate decision. 7-2, see scope for stimulus, okay. So they voted 7-2 to leave rates and change, which you would think, you know, is not great. So maybe um, pound dollar should fall. But then there's a line that says majority see scope for stimulus reduction in the following month. So that's why, you know, sometimes a lot of this takes um, interpretation because the voting wasn't the way we wanted. But this line was very new. And um, so if you take a look at the price action, we, I said immediately this line was the most important, so we're buying pounds here. So I'm just going to scroll back a second so you can actually hear what I was saying. 7-2, see scope for stimulus, okay, buy pounds here, 30, wait, see scope for a stimulus reduction in coming months. Oh, I think pounds are buy, buy 31.75. So it's because this line was hawkish. So we bought 31.75. Even if you bought 32.01, it was fine. I would buy 31.75. Hopefully, you guys got some of it. Um, we'll just buy pounds in general. Okay, so we basically um, bought pounds. I bought pounds at 12. So even though I said buy 32.75, um, when by the time I clicked and I filled, you know, I was trying to be honest, it got filled at 3212 because it did move fast. Closing it here for, we're just closing it here at 40. So bang, 3212. we got, you know, basically 30 pips in just a matter of minutes, but we go on um, and there's more trading. Sorry. And so this was very, very hawkish. I my first lot at 10 and I closed it. Uh, I don't even know what price I close with it, so 43. I'm still going to continue buying. Um, I'm going to sell Euro pounds here at 80. Uh, I'm just going to buy pound straight up. Um, 45. Let's see what I can click on. 40. All right. I got. Let's just look at the charts. Um, so, you know, I wait a little bit, but then I end up buying pounds again and then also selling Euro pounds because with pounds, you really, I mean, you have the, the whole pound spectrum, but you know, your pound's the lower vol one, pound's the high vol one, and we end up pressing this. This keeps interest rates and change of rotating cycle. All of this is pretty much um, hawkish. So I bought at um, 38. So we went along again at 132.38. 132.38. Closing here at 132. Um, just keep buying pounds, right? And then shortly thereafter, charts here. I'm going to say that you know I go short euro pound as well at 70. And I'm going to close it here. I closed at 50. I'm going to keep on buying. Uh, I'm going to try selling euro pounds here at 70. Although really it's not really a smart trade. Because pounds really pound is the ones that, where it's at. yes, because pound really is where it's at. But either way, you know, our trades, you know, when we have a strong conviction and it's a strong event, we just keep on pressing the trade. But the tactic is we didn't just stay long. We um, got in and we got out, we got in and we got out, because there's nothing more important than um, banking your profits and making sure that you, um, you know, that you don't let those Profits melt like ice cubes in your hand, and basically, uh, sorry, um, melts like profits in your hand. You want to make sure with um, day trading, with news trading, that you get in and out, that you ride the momentum in the markets, make sure the momentum's your side, and then you get in and out as quickly as possible. So the last one I wanted to just walk you through um, is FOMC, and because it's also a big event. Um, and then, you know, we'll uh, go back to the other slides. Just to give you, just to recap, you know, the tactics that we've used, even though it may sound like it's just um, uh, reactive trading. 
So with the FOMC rate decision, same story, every single central bank rate decision, we look at the table. So we have our game plan, we set a game plan and to prepare ourselves in terms of the way we're going to think and look at the markets. So, um, you know, for the most part, at first glance, it looks like there's a lot more, not a lot, I would say marginally more green than there's red. And so there's slightly more improvements um, than deterioration in the U.S. economy, and um, you know that basically um, suggests to me that you know perhaps you know they could be positive. So let's look at how we're going to trade this. And remember, unlike um, caddy, where we only trade a dollar cad or pound dollar, which is pound dollar euro pound, with U.S. data we can trade anything. Um, when it comes to trading news. We basically want to um, pair the strongest with the weakest and the weakest with the strongest. So what is expected? No change in interest rates, but you know, September was the big month that Fed was planning to announce balance sheet shrinkage. Um, and our game plan is um, if the Fed announces shrinking the balance sheet and they're hawkish, we're going to buy a dollar again. Um, we always look at it from a dollar yen perspective initially. And then if um, they shrink the balance sheet, and Yellen sounds wishy-washy about um, further about further um, hikes. Then we're going to sell dollar yen. So let's see if we can find out where the FOMC is. Okay, so right around here, dollar yen's at one eleven. Dolly ends at 111.39 when the Fed FOMC rate decision comes out. For a hurricane, it's unlikely to alter economies, of course, they're positive. Forecasts still signal another 27 hike more in the U.S. and $50,000 again. Um, I've picked it up at uh, $50,000. So we went long dollar yen because it said still signal another 2017 hike. Three more in 2018. It was unambiguously hawkish. We had our game plan. We knew exactly what to look for. And they downplayed the hurricane's impact, went long in the 30s. Um, and it's So very important when we use I, I didn't mention that at all when we day trade um, we use 30 um, stop 20 target although oftentimes I may get out before 20 depending upon how much the market wants to give us. So bingo, our eleven sixty three was just hit for plus twenty. And then we um basically you know wait to go long again. So we end up continuing to press the trade, um, uh, the dollar yen trade upwards because this was unambiguously hawkish. We had our game plan. Um, if you go back to our um, chart, let's see if uh, that's not the chart. Um, you know, we were looking for a move up to 112.25. So we're going to press it all the way up to 112.25. So, yeah, we looked at a bunch of you know, real life examples of how we reacted to some of the biggest events in September. We'll be using the same tactic when we live trade ECB later this month. But um, while, it, you know, while it may seem that a lot of it is just interpretation when the data comes out, it does have a very methodical approach. You know, first we start with analyzing the related data. You know, it could be creating that table for, um, uh, you know, looking at how an economy changed from one meeting to the next, or, you know, basically 
you know, every single, in one of the earlier sessions I did for Pepperstone, I talked about leading indicators for economic data, how one um, certain piece of economic data can be used to help us, um, you know, quote unquote, guess um, or educated guess on what um, future economic data may be. And um, so we use that information to help us assess, um, uh, you know, put us into the driving seat so we know exactly how um, to respond and where the likelihood lies. In some of those examples um, of the line trade session, some of them we actually do proactive trading. Like in RBNZ, we were um, bearish uh, Kiwi and we didn't think there was going to be much beyond the RBNZ, so we just did proactive trading. So, um, you know, proactive versus, you have to think about whether you take a proactive versus reactive trade. And then we do instant analysis and then key levels. I'm sure Boris has shared with you some of his key level strategies, but with mine, it has to do with instant analysis, un interpreting the data, understanding it, and then being able to um, confidently ride the price action. So what's the takeaway with, um, with news trading? How can you uh, kind of you know, do this yourself going forward? Well, the first step is um, whenever you have a big news event, the best opportunity is generally the flow trade, the instant reaction continuation trade. But when you do that, you need to be nimble with profits because you don't know how much continuation there could potentially be. And after you're done with the flow trade, I'll be honest with you, um, generally speaking, my best trades come in the first 10 to 15 minutes after the release because um, after that, the market's already settled into its view. Then we watch key levels, and that's when Boris comes in and he trades the key levels after the first um, 10 to 15 minutes um, after the release. So that's how you trade and react to the news like a professional trader, where you know your instant reaction is the flow trade, nimble profits. Don't don't try to press the trade beyond 10 to 15 minutes because usually it's exhausted by then, and um, and you want to ride it, you know. You want to uh, uh, look for your key levels afterwards because that's where those opportunities are. So we went uh, short pound um, uh, and long, uh, sorry, short Cadian earlier this morning. We started our presentation. Um, I still think it's headed lower, but you know we're up more than 10 pips in the pound dollar. If you want to bank that, you can do that. Caddy, um, Caddy and we're down a little bit, but you know, for the most part, I think both trades still look very good, and um, I would stick to our um, 30 stop, 20 target, and I think you know they look like pretty good opportunities. All right, now let's open up the floor to any questions you may have um, about anything we discussed today. So I have a question here. When you are reactively trading news, do you let's say you're using five lots, would you go five lots at one go, or would you enter one standard lot five times? Um, I would just, I personally just go in with the entire position, and then you can scale out. Um, some more questions here. He was talking about putting up positions before news events um, and doing a hedging strategy. I'm not a fan of hedging strategy because usually I have a view and um, you know and usually the that view is expressed in so I'm just looking at um, so actually our target, our plus twenty target on pound dollar was actually hit. So we made twenty pips on pound dollar just right there. So you know you learn something and you made some money this morning. Um, so I don't like hedging strategies personally. Um, I always have a view and I like to trade my view. Um, are those EMAs or SMAs? Very good question. Those are all um, simple moving averages. And we will be posting this link. Do you have a particular strategy that we can use to gauge which new news releases are worth trading? Um, that's very easy actually. Um, a lot of the free calendars out there uh, rank the, the data in terms of high, medium, or low, so you can just look at it from that perspective. How do the yields affect the liquidity or volatility of any currency? They, um, immensely. That's why I look at yields um, you know, all the time. 
And the reason why we chose the short pounds wasn't just the moving averages. Pounds also oftentimes a catch-up currency. And you can see earlier its yields were flat, but now you know all of them. And now 6:30 New York times when I actually lay on my trades, all of them um, have actually turned quite negative. So it's been suggested to me that FX trade should not be done when there's too much news events because it's too volatile. That may be true, but we do some of our best trading. And that's only because some people don't know how to trade news and they're scared to do so. And we make most of our money and we do our best trading when it comes to um, you know trading news basically. So you know, I actually haven't laid on my trades for our members yet because it's um, 6.30 now, so you get the benefit of, uh, of you know, what I would look at. And I still have moving average clearance, um, although you know, we're far more poorly priced than we were at 5.30. But I'm still going to be looking to sell pound dollars, so one minute chart, probably um, in the 40s if I can get it. Um, Do you have a particular strategy that we can use to gauge? Okay, we already talked about the news calendar, how they ranked it. Um, I'm, you know, I'm still not, you know, I don't do hedging strategies, so you know, the, my response is still the same. When you're reactively news trading, um, okay, I answered that already. Do I enter the market after the news or before the news? Sometimes after, sometimes before, more often after than before. What's the best source to get the news release info that you can trade proactively? Well, you have to build the table yourself. I mean, with Pepperstone, I will, um, in my weekly report before um, big news events, I'll oftentimes, you know, uh, include those tables I created um, or like the non-farm payrolls breakdown, I'll include that as well. Why not different OCO entry orders prior to announcement? Because sometimes you have spikes. You know, in those examples I showed you, um, we didn't, but sometimes you'll have huge spikes and um, you could get swept out quickly. And, you know, that um, can happen often. Like in the pound dollar, it did drop initially, but then it completely reversed at the BOE rate decision. And the real trade was to buy, not to sell. Any other questions? What's the best data frame for yields in day trading? Um, I like to look at the 15 minute to 60 minute charts. Any other questions? So I apologize for you know the miscommunication on the timing. I think you guys had daylight savings, so there was a miscommunication um, on that end. But um, yeah, I hope you enjoyed this the session. What is the most effective time frame? There is no most effective time frame. Um, I like multiple time frame analysis where we look at multiple time frames. So you can see, you know, yields are now starting to move lower quite a bit. So U.S. yields and U.K. yields, so the yen crosses actually um, could present some interesting opportunities. Any other questions? I also like selling Euro Yen because remember we have this moving average over Rang Hang at 132.10. Any other questions? Okay, so that's the last question. Thank you so much. Um, and I hope you enjoyed the session.
and you know we made 20 pips you can close your caddyam pretty much here and you know give back maybe three or four pips and you know not only did you learn something uh, you know you also made money uh, showing you how yeah you know, hopefully you understood you know how we look at the markets um, and how some of these how the, some of the thought process has been um, has been made with regards to day trading. All right, thank you so much for inviting me. I don't know if you want to wrap up here, um, Pepperstone. Yes, thank you very much, Kathy. That was amazing. Uh, very good webinar. Okay, so um, as as I said, if you ever want to stay on top of some of these fundamental stuff and how to assess some of the big news events, I always include in our weekly report the things that I think you should know. All right, thank you so much. I'm going to leave the webinar.